too many people don't understand the world we live in today. They think of things in terms that perhaps ultimately are not relevant, whether it's economic, whether it's someone else's fault, whether it's my little bit won't matter if I drive a little less, if I turn off a light switch, if I, if I uh, eat less meat or, or no meat, if I make differences in my own life. I and mean, to me, that's the biggest challenge. How do we just get more people to wake up, learn how the world really works, get them to take those steps, see that every little step matters, that every one of us does, matters, and, uh, and that then to take each one of those steps. What have you found in your teaching that would <coughs> help us move this country in that direction? Well, in a nation like this, uh, everybody taking one small step is very important, no question about that. But at the same time, a nation which wields so much power in the world, it's important certain fundamental policy changes happen. Otherwise, uh, we will be just driving on self-satisfaction, but no real solution. So, it's very important that nations come up with policies which are ecologically sensitive and sensible to do. Individual people, of course, they must do because we are democracies. If we don't express our concern in our… the way we live, the nation or the government is not going to change, the administrations are not going to change by themselves. It is the people's will which is expressed in the form of administrations because after all, most nations are democratic and it's the people who elect the people who get there, all right? Individual action is important for awareness because it's this individual action which will ultimately transform or culminate in the form of a sensitive administration. Without individual concern, a sensitive administration will not come. But we've reached a point on the planet where strong policies are needed. E ecologically sensitive policies are needed. You and me switching off the light is great, I don't even turn on the light, so I don't switch off either <laughs> If I'm… most of the time I'm alone at home, I never turn on the light. I can walk through, you know, darkness very effortlessly, unless I want to read. I just don't turn on a single light in the house, I'm just fine. The dogs are happy, I'm happy <laughs> That's about it, every other creature is happy, lights are not on. So, uh, yes, all of us can do that. It's very important because if we are not ecologically sensitive, we will not bring a, an ecologically sensitive administration or policy makers to the place. But a time has come, strong policies are needed. Without that, there will be no solutions because the turnaround time, as I said, I am not a doomsayer, but uh, if we want to turn around this planet in terms of water, in terms of soil condition, this is something most people ignore in terms of ecology, the soil, the damage we have caused to the soil on the planet is the biggest. Other things may be visible, ice is melting somewhere, it's visible. But the damage to the soil we have caused across the planet is incredible and most dangerous because this is where life evolves. You and me are uh, just a little bit of soil. What was soil became food, what was food became flesh and blood. If we don't get it right now, one day we will get it when we are buried. Yes? Most people get it a bit too late, but everybody gets the point <laughs> at some point. <laughs> so, these things cannot be turned around with individual action. This needs a, a worldwide policy. I think uh, if we want to turn the soil around, if we take concrete action in the next five to ten years, in the next twenty-five to thirty years, we could turn it around quite reasonably. But if, let us say, we don't take any action now and we take action after twenty-five or fifty years, let's say, after fifty years we want to act, to turn around the same soil, it'll take hundred to hundred and fifty years. And that means uh, four to five generations will go through tremendous, terrible states of life because soil is in a bad condition. If we fix the soil, water is fixed, air is fixed, everything is fixed. 
soil must be rich and on because this is the same sod. Well, <clears throat> very well said, and I can give a little context for that. Um, actually, in the next couple of weeks, the DiCaprio Foundation is going to be releasing a study that we've been working on, a plan, not just a study with MIT, with Berkeley, with a number of other institutions around the world, uh, called One Earth, which uh, identifies a path to no more than 1.5 degrees centigrade warming, which, as most of you probably know, there was an agreement reached in Paris three years ago, uh, a climate agreement with, with uh, 174 nations, and the goal was to stop warming at 2 degrees with a hopeful goal of no more than 1.5. We know that a lot of further disasters will occur if we let it get to 2 degrees. So how would you get to 1.5 was the challenge we gave these great academics and we took a look at what it would take to do it. And we came up with three things. That by 2050 we need to move most of the world's energy to, uh, to clean renewable energy. And when we even started talking about this even two or three years ago, it seemed like, mm, could you possibly do that? Are the economics and the technology there? And since then, look at how many companies have committed to go to 100% renewables. How many cities, how many states? The state of California, seventh largest economy on the planet, passed a law, signed into law a couple of weeks ago, to be 100% renewable energy powered by 2045. And we have the pathway to do it. The second leg is indeed to get, by 2050, most of our agriculture back to what we call regenerative agriculture, which is regenerating the soil. It's what our parents and grandparents did. Um, and interestingly, now that uh, Cuba is opening up again, they didn't have access to a lot of petroleum-based fertilizers and, and pesticides and herbicides, so they've continued to do this uh, throughout the last 50 years, I mean, and obviously longer where basically you don't dig up and destroy the, the soil and expose it and, and let all the microbes and the organisms uh, and the organic material decompose into methane, which is a very potent greenhouse gas, and then supplement it with petroleum-based fertilizers. In essence, you're sterilizing the soil, you're killing it, uh, as Sadhguru says, and then you're, you're throwing something on it to try to make it work. And, uh, and instead, we just need to go back to the basic concept of using organic material that's there, harvest our crop, put the organic waste back into the soil uh, with light tilling, uh, uh, with, with light crop practices, and in fact you'll get better yields for far less money um, and be able to restore water and various other ecosystems. And the third leg of the stool um, is we have to save half the planet for nature. And we're obviously not going to say, oh well let's save the southern half and we'll schmutz the northern half. I mean, too late for that. But what we can do is take a look at all the marine protected areas we've already created, the national parks, the ecosystem reserves that exist in every single country, the natural places, even parks in cities, and stitch them together in ways that actually becomes a safety net for the planet, where effectively half the planet is preserved for nature and the ecosystem services that nature provides us. So, uh, for example, many of you may have seen that Sao Paulo a year ago uh, was facing evacuation of a third of the city because they ran out of water. And that was because they had denuded rainforests many, many miles away from Sao Paulo. But that's what had sequestered the rain, sequestered the moisture, nourished the soils, which then allowed aquifers to fill and rivers to flow and so forth, that kept a city of 22 million people alive. When they destroyed those forests, all of that disappeared with the first drought. So now they're learning that that has to be restored, that it's not just for the sake of creatures or, or uh, plants and animals that we'll never see, it's actually for the human ecosystem services as well. I'll, I'll get off my soapbox here, but my point being there's three things that will give us a livable planet and give us uh, a sustainable planet for 10 billion people by 2050. And it is this 100% renewables, 100% regenerative agriculture and saving half for nature. And so your point about soils is really at the centerpiece of all that. Humanity has the intelligence and for the first time the competence to fix things on this planet like never before. We are the first generation who have the necessary competence, intelligence, technology and communication capabilities this human being is a tremendous possibility. In my perception, I think we are just geared, we have everything in place 
to become the greatest generation of humanity ever on this planet because no generation was ever empowered like we are. Are we going to just sit on the threshold and watch or are we going to make it happen is in our hands, let's make it happen.